hello again. Here we are on the surface of uh, Mars, just after the entry, descent, and landing I just did a little while ago. Made that first video. Um, it actually went pretty damn well, all considered. Um, so, one quick thing I want to show off. So, yeah, I need to like caveat all the things I currently kind of have in a in a hacked together mode because I kind of again fix one thing at a time. So let's see. I have set up. Um, let's see. So put some radiators on here. So I've brought a little bit of uh, methane and liquid oxygen to get me to the surface. And there we go. And the rest, the, all these empty tanks, will need to be filled up um, by my ISRU hardware. So I've tucked that under here. Open up. So there is there is no real uh, current um, real solar system or realism overhaul um, ISRU, but I'm working on that for this. Um, I took a bunch of information from you know existing. Th there was definitely some useful code already. I borrowed from some tackless modules we have in realism overhaul and from some real ISRU code that already existed. And so here you can see I'm starting to suck up carbon dioxide. Um, my electricity is currently produced by my hacked together estimated <laughs> uberwatt RTGs, uh, which produce something on the order of um, like 100 kilowatts a piece. I still need to find good uh, concepts for the actual masses of those. Uh, but that's just, you know, don't want to worry about electricity production, just want the actual consumption and whatnot to be accurate. And okay, so all right, I need to remove the other old broken um, CO2 intake from that. So I use tackless for all this because I want this to run while the craft is out of focus. Um, so, you know, you kind of do the math or estimate, okay, this needs to sit on Mars for 180 days or whatever, and and then you, uh, you, know, you want that to actually occur while you're away from the craft for 180 days. Uh, so this system that I've set up uh, produces, so, you know, um, reverse water ga gas something. Sorry, maybe it's Sabatier. I just forget offhand. I apologize. Uh, it's from, I you know, just shortened it from the, um, uh, from the Zer Zubrin document I used f to source my numbers. But anyway, it produces a ton of fuel a day, so in combination of uh, methane and liquid oxygen. So let me just disable that so I can watch the numbers. Uh, disable you. Uh, yeah, the, the Zubrin document has excellent um, resources for, it's got a great grid of energy usage by different subsystems of even different fuel production systems. You know, if you're interested at all in doing something similar to what I'm doing, but with different fuels, or something, um, I highly recommend reading that paper. Um, I only have a high school understanding of chemistry and with a couple of hours or spread over a few days kind of translating some of his stuff, I was able to turn it into realistic RO configs for this. I think that's the forum, I forget. Um, so let's see, so I shut off those production systems. So right, so these radiators, I because it's I've got real um, real fuels, so uh, liquid methane and liquid oxygen, um, well, they should boil off. Now you can tell from these temperatures that clearly they're way above the temperature they would normally boil off, but because I'm tackling one problem at a time, I modified the boil off fuels for liquid oxygen and liquid methane uh, so that they're 200 degrees Kelvin higher than they actually are, which even then still causes weird, confusing things to occur just because the, like, I just set these to just the straight stock code for radiators. I don't even know what they're cooling. They just say they're cooling something, maybe even just each other or the engines. I really don't know. I just have a ton of trouble with any radiator code. So the thermal system is, you know, is still new and not heavily used. Mostly it seems to be used for um, having, you know, in stock, you've got your nuclear engines, OMGGs, they produce a ton of heat, you must have the radiators to cool them. Like that seems to be their real function. So, you know, it takes a lot of fiddling to kind of move those towards more realistic behavior that works at time warp. And, you know, Nathan Kell is certainly doing that. I'm sure Bob's improving his own code as well, uh, or Rover Dude. Um, let's see. Um, and whoever whoever else is working on the thermal system in stock. But right now, uh, Nathan Kell suggested I just try to leave these radiators on stock, and they seem, with these increased boiling points, that I don't get boil off. But um, just 
doing the dance, like I my next step with this craft. So I'm able to land it. I've you know, demonstrated my, to myself, and I plan probably maybe to show in the same video or another one that at this stage I can get everything to fill up and be able to launch this craft back up to Mars orbit or even to an Earth return. Now, my test craft doesn't currently have a heat shield, so sending it to an Earth return would just be sending it to a fiery grave. Yeah, I don't have any science units set up on this craft to, you know, have this as a, um, um, like an unmanned precursor, say, to like a Mars Direct mission, because obviously you want, wouldn't want to just send this to Mars and, and hope that it works. Um, so you'd want to have an unmanned um, precursor to a Mars Direct type mission, but on the other hand, you don't want to just throw all this money and hardware at Mars and not get anything back for it. So I imagine you'd want, they would um, rig a test craft like this up with science instruments to, you know, take soil samples or whatnot, move them up to the capsule that can be returned to Earth, and so, you know, you get some bang for your buck. You don't just get uh, proof of concept, um, you know, that you can get Mar Mars ISRU and send, um, a, you know, a man-sized uh, piece of hardware back to Earth, but they'd probably want to get some science out of it too. Um, even just atmosphere or surface samples or whatever you could do mechanically. Um, there's tons of improvements I could make on this craft. Um, you know, any code or modifications I make are, you know, both through these videos and through GitHub and such, all the code is free for other people to use, right? Somebody else wants a different mission profile with this, they are totally free to do that. I'm just kind of going to document as I improve things step by step. And currently my goal will be to make what I'm doing reproducible rather than just my local hack together files. So make sure I can get it onto GitHub and um, recreate what I'm doing. Um, so from just the GitHub code rather than, you know, uh, how you kind of just hack it together when you're creating configs yourself. So it looks like the radiators have cooled whatever they were cooling down to the temperatures that they want it to be. Um, looks like I got some more boil off of my uh, oxygen and, and liquid methane. Oh, and I didn't recalculate how much of this I need. So let me just, so I'll link to my GitHub, I'll link to all the things. Uh, let me, oh, I clo oh, no, I didn't close that, good. So on the GitHub pull request for this, I note that, um, so the hydrogen, um, well, uh, let me try quickly step back. So this is producing liquid methane and oxygen. Now methane is carbon and hydrogen, so I'm uh, carbon can be pulled from the air of Mars, so that's why we pull in carbon dioxide. Let me turn that on. Also, obviously, the oxygen can be uh, separated and turned into liquid oxygen. So that's, you, know, you can look in the Zubrin paper if you want to see the real uh, reality uh, chemistry behind that. And that's what this hardware will it re represents in real ISRU. So we pull in the carbon dioxide. So methane, carbon, and hydrogen. Well, this gives us the uh, carbon, and from Earth we bring hydrogen. Um, there are other potential proposals for doing that, but this is the one I'm currently uh, trying to recreate. So hydrogen is brought from Earth. Uh, in my current system, these four tanks around the outside are full of hydrogen. Um, I think to get good behavior with tackless, I, that's why I threw a big battery on this as a buffer for power and carbon dioxide storage. Um, those may not end up being necessary in my final version, but in this um, kind of state of things, it is. Um, so th we have pipes that look like, so they're feeding, they're actually, they are feeding this liquid hydrogen uh, to the core. Uh, so because they're in this core unit, and I think everything's surface attached uh, runs nicely, they're providing the hydrogen to this unit here, which I will now turn on. There we go. All right. So it also requires their carbon dioxide, which is produced by this, and somehow it seems like the carbon dioxide just flows through it, possibly because it's considered a, a life support resource. But thankfully, I don't have to set up crazy pipes to make that work. Uh, so what else? So the outflow of fuel. So the carbon dioxide and the liquid hydrogen coming from these external tanks, which are you know straight piped out. So now you might wonder, so for you know, because the liquid methane and liquid oxygen are produced in this core, you know from here they get into here. So why do these pipes flow in? Well, because of the way that the inverse, the, the way things are coded. So if something in the center was consuming, uh, you'd want the pipes flowing in like this. So the pipes flow in this direction. But if something in the core is producing, I would think that I want, would want the pipes to flow from where they're being produced outwards, but the way that these fuel lines are coded, it's the opposite of that. And I'm sure it can be explained as some kind of 
logical assumption, but that's just the way it is. And that's why I have to have this in the central column. Um, so that's why I have these four smaller engines around the outside. Oh wow, I used a lot of ignitions on landing. <laughs> um, so in its current state of testing, um, you know, just kind of iteratively re uh, improving the realism of everything I'm doing here, like I have boil off basically disabled, but in reality I will have to have some high-powered radiators once that gets worked out. Um, these four engines don't actually represent a real engine, so I've called them Mini Plus. I should probably rechange the names once to kind of make it all consistent, but um, in my original design I had just one CE CE uh, engine. You should uh, look that up. I think it's a NASA designation. It's a, a methane um, fueled engine that um, I had it in the center, so it represented a, a fairly real plan for an actual NASA engine that might have even been tested with methane. I, I don't recall offhand. But because I can't have that engine down the center, because I have to have this in the center, I created these uh, mythical engines that should have one quarter of the mass and one quarter of the thrust. So added together, they have the thrust of one. Uh, also, for my little sample return craft in my very first test, um, you'll see it in the realism overhaul, or uh, sorry, the real ISRU GitHub. Uh, in November, it was a, a tenth of a CECE -E engine. Got a similar mixing ratio. Mixing ratio of so how much methane to how much oxygen is quite important with a craft like this because you don't go with what's optimal for getting the most efficiency from your engine, you go with what gives you the best bang for your buck of hydrogen brought from Earth. So if you want to see that in more detail, you can look in the Zubrin paper I'll link, or you know, if, if people, whatever aspect of this that people are most interested in, um, me talking about or describing or showing or whatever, just put it in the comments and I will you know, address those either in comments or in the video. But I intend to make this as realistic as possible, and so it's just an iterative process because it's such a complex mission proposal. So right now you can see it's producing a little bit of these fuels, so when I time warp you can see it's producing more. So these are a little imbalanced, so before I do anything... Oh right, so it's set up to produce um, a ton of fuel a day, so everything in here is actually in liters, so actual liters uh, being produced and consumed each second. So in my git uh, in the GitHub for real ISRU, I just noted because it's going to be very useful for for mission planning. Um, in practice, it consumes six hundred and uh, or so, sorry seven hundred sixty seven liters of LH two a day. It produces five hundred and eleven liters of liquid methane, uh, six hundred and eighty six liters of liquid oxygen. So that's what this chunk of hardware in the middle uses. And I think I actually noted here as well it it consumes. Um, this ISRU combination currently consumes 255 kilowatts, uh, which is huge. So that's why I have these hacked together RTGs. I need to find a source for how could I possibly produce that amount of energy. And this craft doesn't really need that with its current design. It doesn't need it to be the fuel to be produced that fast, because you could do this over a period of months, literally, you're kind of like in the Martian. Again, you produce the fuel in a slow trickle. Uh, as long as you refrigerate it, it just keeps building up on Mars. But having this high production, one, it was one of the actual values in the Zubrin paper. So if I want to build a really big craft that can send humans, and so let's say two, three, four humans, and a year's supply of, of, of you know food resources from this point, so you know they land another craft, they work here for a while, and then when it's time to return, they have a, the, you know, the big brother of whatever this craft will be. So the human crew jumps in, they have a year's worth of life support supplies and habitation space and um, and a heat shield for return to Earth, all of that parked here and fueled up. So you need a lot of fuel production. So that's what this was, was intended. This will, um, that's my goal to create. Um, again, if you're interested in manned mission to Mars, uh, I highly recommend you look into the Mars Direct proposal. Um, the, the short version of the weaknesses of it, in my opinion, are that it seems it would be stressful. It, you know, you don't have a lot of space for your astronauts to reside in, or you know, you have a relatively small crew. But the advantage is you make really great and clever, you know, leverage of your resources, um, and both resources on Mars and kind of com combined usage of your hardware, like the habitation that the people use. Um, while coasting from Earth to landing on Mars, also and can be their habitation when they land on Mars. So you don't have to build multiple. And ultimately, each mission to manned mission to Mars requires two launches from Earth, 
not huge launches either, to, to actual large like SLS size launches. So I highly recommend you look into it. I can do a video where I describe it, talk about it a bit more, but I mean my ultimate goal is to actually create the code for Kerbal and the, you know, set up the parts and such so that those Mars Direct missions can actually be carried out. Um, just yeah, two large launches from Earth. Like for instance, this kind of test craft, uh, which is you know not a, not a within an order of magnitude of what the final Mars Direct return craft will be. What, what I noted it down, but you could see it in the the previous video. So when it hit the Mars atmosphere, um, it was uh, what was it? A uh, 21, 22 tons. Like that's something that say Falcon Heavy could send or small, like the original version of SLS could send. Uh, to Mars. So using these the technologies in this, um, just simple simple chemistry of producing fuel and refrigerating it on Mars, um, we could actually send a substantial probe to Mars, have it fuel up there, and then actually send something back. We could get a sample return from Mars. And in, in my opinion, that will be something we do before um, men land on Mars, or humans, sorry, land on Mars. So anyway, you can see all of this is producing, uh, and what I love to watch with real ISRU, uh, something ex like rare, potentially never seen in real solar system and realism overhaul before using you know tricks like this, you can see these numbers actually increasing, and you can see your delta V increasing with time. So the longer this craft stays on the surface, the more delta V it has, which is re really cool in, in stock Kerbal. Um, but in the real solar system, because you need so much more mass and delta V to do anything, it's even more precious to see it done you know, fairly realistically um, in realism overhaul, a real solar system. So I, that's you know just another thing. There's uh, people could use this code or these parts or whatever uh, to do all kinds of more realistic and interesting things in the real solar system. Uh, so let me just close you up. I don't need you. Um, so one of the tools of hyperedit. So these are unbalanced right now, so I'm just going to tick them and I may as well just tick them all the way down. So if you've, you know, if you're a, a calculator whiz, uh, like I forgot to be this morning, so you'll see that this amount of liquid hydrogen is not enough to fill up these tanks. That's that's a problem. So in practice I will need to bring larger hydrogen tanks to Mars uh, in order to do this. Now or one of the you know, proposed concepts in the Mars Direct um, papers relating to Mars Direct are that when you get to Mars, like these tanks are empty. Like your fuel tanks for the most part, other than the uh, the fuels you use to actually perform your landing, they're empty. So those tanks could be full of liquid hydrogen rather than them being these separate tanks uh, as I have them on the periphery, because liquid hydrogen is not very dense. So you need large tanks. Like these tanks are big, like you think, why? what's the point of doing this? Uh, well these tanks are big, but they're very light. Um, and, and the ISRU hardware, yes, you have to fly it to Mars, land it on Mars. I don't have to bring it back. Once I'm done producing my fuel, I can dump this. I can dump these tanks, right? So it's mass that I do need to land on Mars, but it allows me to produce huge amounts of fuel on Mars. Uh, like in my test yesterday, so I found this craft before it lands was you know, 21 and a half tons. When I take off and I dump all this other hardware, I have a craft that has about 38 tons. So that's not alchemy, that's not magic, that's just chemistry on Mars. You actually can launch more from Mars than you actually had in terms of mass when you hit the Mars atmosphere, and that's that's a huge advantage to any to any, any mission that has to do as much as a craft that goes to Mars and comes back. Um, so something I need to check for in, uh, in real fuels, because um, it currently doesn't allow, so these outer tanks, so the real proposal could be that many of these tanks in you know, the middle um, were full of the liquid hydrogen when you get here, you crank up the hardware, it fills some of the other tanks, um, pulling the liquid hydrogen from your core tanks, and then later you fill the core tanks back up with you know, liquid um, methane and liquid oxygen. So then you need to bring even fewer tanks, therefore less mass, to Mars. Uh, that's currently not changing the mix of fuels inside a tank is currently not possible in real fuels, you know, with these procedural fuel tanks, but it's, it's a concept Nathan Kell has talked about at some point in the past of including, because it is rational, right? If I had this tank completely empty of these things, there's no reason it couldn't be full of liquid hydrogen, and then once it's empty of liquid hydrogen, these tank, the tanks could be filled up with something else. 
So that would require a bit of coding. I might just do a bit of hackery to uh, artificial to basically make that function with the current structure of uh, these tanks, which would you know obviously on the face of it be cheating uh, by the code. So I could just rather than a let's say what is this roughly an eight thousand liter tank being able to hold eight thousand liters, I could make it able to hold sixteen thousand liters. So effectively manage it myself manually on my own honor code that. I'm only going to start allowing these tanks to fill. I would have them locked until the liquid hydrogen that had been in them was empty and then fill them up. Yes, on the face of it, it's cheating, but it's good for testing this. And at some point, real fuels will allow you to convert, uh, hopefully will allow you to convert what is stored in a tank while in flight like this. Uh, but for now, during testing, I'm also totally fine just having these tanks that I have to bring um, separately storing to store the liquid hydrogen. So anyway, the one other th quick thing I want to show off of this. So, hmm, that's weird. oh right, I emptied these. Right, right. Okay. So one quick thing I wanted to show off. So uh, a reason I did code it this way, uh, using tackless modules, tackless a life support system. Uh, highly recommend. Very useful. Uh, switch to. So I'm just going to switch to a different craft and then run time for three or four days. And I can show you when you come back to the, to the landed craft. There we go. This is my ScanSat in orbit, which will actually... ScanSat does some really cool things. They, I find they haven't quite um, been able to replicate in stock yet, but I mean, ScanSat started way earlier. Just look, you can... Uh, if these resources existed in stock, or if you know, at some point somebody actually makes maps for realistic resources, uh, like groundwater, as an example, for Mars or other planets, look how quickly you can just toggle between these. That's why I really like these mods and their interfaces. Oh yeah, I don't have a bio, I don't have a biome scanner. I just brought this scanner here to actually get this. Um, yeah, it's just amazing. Like in any view, I can see this custom height map I have for Mars. Oh, I think it's actually showing the numbers sanely now. Uh, let's see. So you can see, so, rel so as the lowest points on Mars, in this little red, that's why I set up the color scheme as it is. So you can see like a high point on Mars is 13 kilometers altitude above uh, this low point where I've chosen, you know, this area I've chosen to land. And with Mars's thin atmosphere, that the atmosphere is way thinner up here than it is down in this basin. So anyway, that was a cool thing to be able to show. Uh, I love ScanSat. Uh, it's, um, uh, Nathan Kell recently made it um, much more compatible in Realism Overhaul. I think we may even have some uh, missions available for RP0 using ScanSat quite soon. I highly recommend it. So I'm just going to zap through a few days. Uh, so Tackless, it doesn't calculate, say, the resources of this craft. You know, I'm not aware of any mod that does while you're away from it. But when you switch back, it compares its clock. You know What, uh, what was the universal time when somebody last looked at this craft? What is the time now? What's the time difference? And then does a catch-up phase. So I find it's a, a little bit rough sometimes. Uh, that's why I have the extra battery and carbon dioxide storage, just for how it actually ends up doing that catch-up time calculation. But even though it's, it's imperfect, as every bit of code is, it is an amazing function to have. So you could land this craft, set it up, do your, your math by hand, because I don't write C-sharp code or anything, no real mods. Um, you, I would do the math by hand, and then I come back to the craft, and I would expect when the catch-up starts to occur, you'll see, oh, come on, you'll see my resources consumed. There you go. See, the liquid hydrogen is being consumed, the liquid methane and liquid oxygen are being produced, just like that. And I probably have the proportions of these wrong. I need to, uh, this is why it's not up on GitHub yet. I'm just showing off what, what's my goal, how am I going about it, and pretty soon I'll uh, you know, today or tomorrow or sometime in the next week, I'll do a bit of polish, and that will actually make these tanks the right size to match these engines, yada yada. You know, there's a lot of clever numerical balancing that I personally enjoy, other people hate, and I, I feel like that's one thing I do, uh, I do well. I, you know, I'm fine balancing all these numbers, making sure they're realistic and they match the papers, uh, rather than writing C-sharp code. So I'll make sure these balance, and they balance with the um, the Zubrin paper, etc. And soon, you know, all the all the, the code for these engines, 
Um, the code for these will be in a mod called Real ISRU. I'll link it. It's already got a number of cool parts. I just find they're not quite as easy for me to use. Um, and I might explain that later on, but uh, right now I just created parts that specifically reflect the actual um, proposal of Mars Direct, because uh, that's what I'm trying to create. I think this is probably my longest video ever, um, but I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you liked uh, seeing what I'm doing here. Um, you know, thumbs up if you like that. Uh, please ask any questions. And I'll post a link to a forum thread where I'm just kind of discussing all the challenges of um, a mission like this from the entry, descent, and landing you saw through fuel production like this uh, to alternative ways of landing on Mars, like using a balut or parachutes, um, propulsive landing, which I used a little bit of here, where you use engines. Um, really every aspect of, of you know, we'd, a challenge you'd run into with a man, uh, Mars mission. So thanks for watching. Hope you watch.